Bill, this could be your whale, bub. Coming up, head on. Left, camera left, left, left. Uh, this is G, you have a new whale. We're getting to a point here where we're crossing the first Okay, stand. Uh, almost, right here, coming up. Okay, right here, coming up. Hi, I'm Lauren Miller. This time on Journeys, I'll introduce you to Moira Brown. She and her team of marine biologists spend hours in the Bay of Fundy in pursuit of the endangered right whale. Now, I know we've heard the word endangered so many times these days, we've almost become desensitized to it. You sort of get a sense of futility, like you can't do anything about it, so why bother getting frustrated even thinking about it? Well, Moira Brown and her team have decided to do something about it. There's only about 300 right whales left in these waters, and they used to number in the hundreds of thousands. It's the most endangered large whale in the world. Moira Brown and her team hope that the research that they are doing will bring the right whale back from the edge of extinction. In detail, the forecast for Fundy and Graham and Ann. Winds will increase from the south ahead of the system, reaching gale force over northern areas this afternoon. I have a funny feeling it's going to be a very short day. Well, at 5 a.m., that's how the day began, with a healthy dose of skepticism. It could be too windy to search for right whales today, but I had to be optimistically skeptical because this is our only day to film right whales. Man. It might be too windy. Mm. So take a look at the channel? Yeah, can't hurt. <laughs> Alright. I mean, I actually sort of leave it up to you, Mo. <laughs> the problem we have here is that the research team has a 30-foot boat to hunt for right whales in the very rough, unpredictable waters of the Bay of Fundy. As I was to find out, this little boat can really get hey, bounced good around. Good the only reason they're even trying to go out today is for our documentary crew. Kind of windy. That book you look at the seltzer. Yeah. Anyway, we'll give it a try. We'll take a peek. Come back to lunch. <laughs> We're very anxious to see the right whale, the rarest and most endangered whale on Earth. On the leeward side. Every summer they breed right off our doorstep in Canadian waters. We also want to see why Moira Brown and the right whale research team endures very difficult conditions to learn more about this whale. They're working on a project funded by the New England Aquarium in Boston, and they spend most of the summer here identifying the few remaining right whales. Marine weather is a constant concern with such a small boat. It takes two hours traveling before they even get to a place where they'll see whales. Then they spend 10 hours collecting data before they turn around for a two to three hour trip home. Yeah, we're still in the Lubeck Channel here. What we've done, we just come down underneath the Lubeck Bridge, which goes, the International Bridge, which goes between Lubeck and Campobello, which is in Canada, in Brunswick. Oh, yeah. We'll just work our way down out through the Lubeck Channel, and then we'll start to see Grand Manan, the island of Grand Manan, right. which we'll pass to the north of, uh, across the Grand Manan Channel, and then from there we've got about another 10 miles out to the Grand Manan Basin where we can start looking for right whales. Moira Brown first started work on the right whale identification project after graduating from a program in wildlife biology at McGill University in Montreal. She needed a summer job and counting whales sounded intriguing. Well, that's where it started. And since that summer nine years ago, Moira's work has evolved from counting whales to photographing them to pulling skin and blubber samples. I think I got involved in this work just out of, a, out of an interest to see how the whale research was done, perhaps even out of a skepticism to see if we really could tell individual whales apart. And I believe we can, and I stay in it just because it it's just completely captivates me. It's completely fascinating. And it, there's so many different facets of it. It's not 
just pure science, and it's not just conservation or management, but it's putting all these things together in a way so that we can do something to keep right whales around. Simply identifying each right whale provides critical information when you're looking at the genetic health of the whole population. Today, I'd be happy just to find one. It looks like they've got some. What you got, Philip? Maybe some beach or some sort. I don't see any blow associated with it, though. So. The whales are identified by distinguishing features like scars and marks and bumps on their heads called the callosity pattern. Once you know who's who, you know who's mating with whom and whether their calves are healthy and surviving. From that, a family history evolves and you can start to understand how healthy the population is. We only have 60 known mothers in this population. So right now, the future of this population is resting on 60 females. And they're only having a single calf every three to four years. So in any given year, we could only expect, let's say between 15 and 20 females to be giving birth. And in fact, we don't even see that many. Ooh, the tide has changed now and it's running against the wind, right? It's around 9.30 in the morning. We've been riding these waves for almost four hours now. Right. It's difficult to even spot nice the whales in waves like these, and it's definitely too rough to get a steady picture. Yeah, we'd never be out here to do the work in these kind of seas because we're trying to get good quality still photographs yeah. of the whales' velocity patterns, and you'll see You start to know these animals so well. When we're out on the water, we can identify probably 50 or 60 percent of the animals we see on site. We have a lot of them named, mostly to help us identify them in the field, and they're named for their callosity pattern or their or scarring. And when you start to see animals having, like the females, for example, you know, we have one, she had a calf in 1967 that we know of, and she's had calves in 81, 84, 87, 91. You start to become quite involved with, with these animals' lives. Mm -hmm. And you know, we just can't, I mean, it sounds sort of silly, but we just can't wait to get here in, in August to find out who's had a calf. <laughs> you know, if you haven't had a calf for three years, well, then you're, you know, you're due, let's say, in 1993. And so yeah. we're out there racing in the bay, sort of betting with each other who's going to show up with a calf, who isn't. Okay, Jenny, you want to do a watch off the stern, please? One banana in A, three in B, two in C, we pursued the whale that Phil and Amy spotted for about 20 minutes. It seemed to be evading us, and now with the tide coming in straight at us against high winds, we had to make some decisions. Well, this is the first time we actually saw part of the animal. So far, it's just been a blow, and um, saw a little bit ahead and didn't see any velocity pattern. So my guess is it is probably just a fin whale. It's um, not arching, so we're not seeing a dorsal fin, but. Um, even if it's a right whale, I don't think we'll be able to work it. I mean, it's yeah. blowing once or twice, traveling for seven minutes, you come, you know. Coming back, yeah. oh yeah. I mean, we would never be able to get near to get photographs. So. With that news, my optimism is quickly evaporating. Unless a miracle happens, it doesn't look like we'll see right whales or the team's work. And after hearing so much about it all, that's a real disappointment. Uh, definitely, the, the, further, the further we go, just that little turning into the seas, I don't... Yeah. Really we're gonna know get how, how long back. we want to stay yeah. out. No. no, or if we could even shoot anything. I, I mean, we want to shoot you guys working. You're not going to be able right. to work. We can't right. work. Yes. So, I think this is. I, think I don't really want to go any further. And, I don't, and it's only going to get worse through the morning as the tide continues to right. run against the wind. So we call it a dress rehearsal. So I think it, it has probably become a dress rehearsal. <laughs> yeah. Just as we agreed to go back for breakfast, Chris took a radio message that right whales had been sighted by a whale watching boat about 20 miles east of our location. So despite the waves, the team was ready to give it a try. In fact, as we traveled with the tide and the wind, the seas seemed a lot calmer. We hoped we'd get lucky.
Hey, this is what we've been waiting for. At that first sighting, everyone on the team knows exactly what to do. Hopefully, it's not another false alarm. Once we encounter right whales, then the first priority is photo identification. We take mug shots, basically, of the callosity pattern on their head. These callosities are black, raised, roughened areas on the rostrum. And the rostrum is the top part of the head between the blowholes and, and the, tip of the, the tip of the snout, or the bonnet. Right. Okay. And each right whale has a different pattern on their head. So what we want to try and do is get left side, right side, head on if possible. And then some of these whales, well, many of these whales, over 50% of these whales have scars on them from various encounters with boats and fishing gear and this kind of thing. So we use those as identifying characteristics as well. The team has compiled their photographs into a right whale catalog. It also includes diagrams and remarks about the distinguishing features of each like individual the whale. That truck bias to me. Well, except the one that truck, truck bias had uh, fluke scars in 1660 didn't have fluke When we scars. realized we could distinguish between individuals, then that allows us to monitor the population, monitor reproduction, survivorship, mortality. All these things that when you're just when you're just out there counting whales, you don't know how old they are, other than gross size differences between calves and adults. Look, if you have any requests, just holler. If you think you need to speed up or uh, you can see it, Chris. You know what I need. You have no idea of knowing how often they're having calves, yep. what the sex of the calves are, all, all these sort of really basic life history parameters that you can't get unless you can identify individuals. So now that we can identify individuals, we know we have mothers that have had three and four calves during the time we've been studying them. We have some females that have become grandmothers that we know of um, during the last 13 years. The right whale population was virtually wiped out by hunters and hovered on the verge of extinction in the early 1900s. Right whales have been protected worldwide since 1937, but the northern right whale population is not growing. To find out why, Mo was working on a collaborative study with researchers from Canada and the United States studying right whale genetics. Analyzing DNA from the whale's blubber and skin will answer questions about fertility, genetic diversity, and general health. Uh, a little bit. A little bit. <laughs> to get skin and blubber samples, Mo had to get inventive. This crossbow designed to hunt moose and bear has been modified to become a laboratory instrument. Yeah, what was the time for B? Okay, one whale in this group is A. A with the peduncle scar. I know it looks severe, but when you're 50 feet long and weigh 75 tons, Mo says it's like getting your finger pricked for a blood sample. So Ames, it's up to you then to uh, yep. sort of judge whether or not you're going to be good enough. Two whales. Can you be ready to back the up, Chris? Yep. I don't know if we're going to get that lucky. We may have to go after this one. Wow. Once it comes Big, up. fast speed. <laughs> That's A. I hate to drive up on top of a whale acting like that. OK, Mo. All right, Phil, this could be your whale, bub. You ready, Amy? Coming up. We'll show you much more than a skin sample when journeys continue. This is sort of like a mosquito bite to a right whale. And in most, most cases, they don't even react when the, when the biopsy dart hits their skin. And it, it's sort of like darting an inner tube. I mean, the, the, the arrow hits the whale and bounces right off in a matter of a second. Their skin is very elastic. Mm -hmm. And uh, we shoot from distances up to about 80 feet, but I prefer to shoot, just for, for accuracy reasons, between 40 and 60 feet. Mm -hmm. And so the arrow will hit perpendicular to the skin of the whale and then just bounce. I mean, just that fast. I get a plug of skin that's about an inch long and about seven millimeters in diameter mm -hmm. uh, because that's just the, the size of the opening, the leading edge of this, of this cylinder. Right. And then if we're lucky, we also get a piece of blubber, which gives us more information. In other words, we can do genetics and look at, look at the animal's DNA from the skin sample and then from the blubber sample, we can also get some idea of what the animals are carrying in the way of contaminant loads. 
DNA tests have already shown there are only three family lines in the right whale population. Now that means when the population was at its smallest at the turn of the century, there were only three unrelated families. Breeding with such limited variation in the gene pool can lead to very unhealthy, even infertile whales. It's more, there's still more. It's stuck inside the, uh, the dart. Okay. Hang on just a sec. That's so what we're gonna, Yeah. What we're going to do now is just cut the skin up into smaller bits and pieces okay. to make sure the salt solution imp completely impregnates the, the skin tissue. Right. And then that'll preserve it until I can get it to the lab to do the analysis. Well, how thick is a whale's skin? Right whales have skin that's an inch thick. It's uh, much thicker than, let's say, a fin or a humpback. Fin whales are about a quarter of an inch, humpbacks about a half an inch. Right. Right whales are like belugas. Belugas also have skin that's about an inch thick. Okay. Which is nice for our work because it means we can get a plug of skin with which we can do a lot of DNA experiments. Right. With this size of skin sample, Mo can do hundreds yeah, of DNA good. tests. She shares this data with another scientist doing another study. And for all of this, she only has to dart each whale once. She hopes that further DNA testing will reveal whether there are enough whales contributing to the gene pool for this species to survive. Okay, Janet, what was that animal's letter? A. All right, so what we do is we just label each one of these with just the animal's letter for the day. So that's E-G-A, right whale A, on the 12th of September. And now uh, I'll just leave this sample in the solution until we get back to the lab in, uh, in November. Right. And then I'll extract the DNA and start doing experiments with it. Okay. okay, we're all set for another one. I think we owe it to these animals. I mean, we're responsible for their demise. No two ways about it. There was not an environmental disaster of any kind. We basically just went out and, and hunted so many of them that we knocked the population down to such a low level that it's amazing they're really even still around. And I think we kind of owe it to the species to do what we can to keep them around and allow them to, to repopulate. It is the, it's the only whale species that was subjected to such intensive hunting that hasn't rebounded. Right whales breed and feed in Canadian waters from about June to November every year. They migrate here from calving grounds off the coast of the southeastern United States. One of the leading causes of death for the right whales is collisions with ships. The whales like to feed in the deep shipping lanes. And Moira Brown is trying to encourage awareness about the plight of the right whale. She wants the government to protect them by law. The right whales don't suffer from an identity crisis. They suffer from just the fact that no one knows they're even alive yeah. still. Many people think the population went extinct years ago. And what we're trying to do at this point, it's not even an education program, it's really just a basic awareness program that yes, right whales are still alive. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots of them in Canadian waters and uh, just keep an eye out for them. And what we're trying to do with this awareness program is just reduce the potential for ship whale collisions. Keep an eye out for that whale off the bow. I don't want to crowd it. A little bit closer, Chris, would be better because we're against the wind. Some shipping and fishing companies have agreed to slow down and post an observer when they're in right whale territory. But in Canada, there's no government legislation requiring them to do that. Photograph the close one. There, there, Kenny. Whales bring out something in people, and I'm not exactly sure what it is, but there certainly is a lot of concern for the welfare of right whales, now that people are starting to realize they are, in fact, st still on this earth. So uh, hopefully we can continue the education programs, continue the science, and uh, continue putting the whole picture together. For the few months the researchers are here in Lubeck, Maine, they live and work in this field station. So far the right whale identification project has named and numbered 325 right whales. Now this isn't as exciting as having a swaying deck below your feet or feeling the spray of a right whale, but this is where a big part of the work gets done. On our off days, we are usually in the office, we're looking, doing photographic analysis. In other words, we've, we've taken lots of slides from when we were out earlier this year in August. And as those slides start to pour in, sometimes we're shooting 10 rolls a day, which when you think of it, it's 300 slides a day. Okay, and we'll send those down to Katana. Most of our, our off days are, are spent in the office, putting all the, the slides together into, 
individual animals, getting ready to match those to the photographic catalog, data entry into the computer. And now we've gotten to a point where we have a pretty good idea of how many right whales there are. We know pretty much where they are. And we have a little bit of information on how many calves are born each year. And now we can use that information to try and develop recovery plans to keep this species around for a little while longer. Uh, we went through uh, F, N, N. Mo and Chris are matching the photos they took to the whales they already have in the catalog to confirm the identification of each whale. If the photographs don't match the cataloged whales, then after checking and rechecking, they'll enter the photo as a new whale. And there's a Z in the uh, whale watcher sheets, right? Right. Z okay. in the whale watcher sheets looks like this one. Okay, we'll make that one we'll make Each scientist on the team is collecting data for their own individual projects as well as for the New England Aquarium's identification program. Mo is working on her PhD at the University of Guelph in Ontario. She, of course, is looking at right whale genetics and demographics. Chris is from Georgia. He runs a right whale survey project in the southeastern United States. And Amy, over at the computer, is doing a paper on right whale calving and reproduction. Janet, who is also on the boat, is a volunteer. And Phil is the Hawkeye right whale spotter. He knows every single whale on site. Everyone shares the data that's been collected for their individual projects, but each member of the team has a common goal. Well, the long-term goal is to try and keep right whales around for, you know, the next few hundred years. Mm -hmm. And to do that, we have to, in we have to sort of do everything we can to increase survivorship, or let's put it this way, decrease mortality that's caused by humans. Mm -hmm. Uh, with such a small population, every whale is important. Every single animal that's born is important. So everyone we lose is, is a major loss. You know, it's a, it's a high percentage loss for the population. Oh, this is the same whale. Yeah, I think so too. Tell because about the skin it's, not really four, it's not really four islands, it's three islands with a little peninsula off the bonnet on the yeah. right hand side. And but the it could go either way. Gives it away. Yeah. All right, so that means that Z and LL. Or can duplicates, are duplicates of each other, so let's put all, all those together. up there. See if I can find some more of that wheel. Okay. Some days, Mo says you just have to get out of the office. On the days when the wind and waves keep the team landlocked, you could just find them on the water anyway, kayaking at a favorite place called Reversing Falls. This part of the world is very special to Moira Brown. It's where she can do the work she loves. She's been coming back here for years, and it's a place she hopes to return to for a long time to come. This project's been going for 13 years, and that sounds like a long time, but really, in terms of trying to figure out what an animal is all about, it's basically three, three or four calving cycles of a female right whale. So that's not really a great long period of time in the lifespan of a right whale. And we need to continue the monitoring study, just the basic monitoring study, to be able to look at, keep, keep tabs on reproduction, see which females are becoming reproductively active. Females that we first knew as calves, see them mature, what age do they become sexually mature, and try to get some idea of the, the reproductive biology of this species. We, have, we know a little bit now, but we still have a long way to go. And also to continue the, the genetics work. And it's not just, I mean, I'm always talking about right whales, and it's not just right whales that I, that, that this kind of work will, will affect in the end, but hopefully it will, it will affect the space that right whales occupy, and the other species that are in those spaces will also benefit from what we can do for right whales. The kind of field research that Moira Brown and her team are doing is really hard work, and Moira has been doing it for more than nine years now. And even so, nine years of very difficult field research is just a short time when it comes to this kind of work. Because they're only really beginning to identify the whales out there, and they're only starting to understand their behavior. Moira hopes to extend her genetic work to more completely understand the genetic health of these whales, and therefore their potential to survive. And with Moira Brown's kind of determination and perseverance, Maybe the right whale has a future after all. For Journeys, I'm Lauren Miller. The 
right whale adoption program is run by East Coast Ecosystems, which is a non-profit organization that's trying to make Canadians more aware that right whales are, are still around. We have three whales up for adoption. We can't possibly put them all up for adoption, although we'd like to, but we, have, we choose three whales that represent different areas of our research. And so with the right whale adoption program, people receive a certificate with a photograph of the whale and uh, their name on the certificate and uh, a description about their particular whale, its personal biography, as well as a description of all the different work that we're doing right now. And then at the end of the year, you'll see the, a newsletter sort of talking about what we've seen the past field seasons and if your whale has been identified, re-identified or not. And just sort of keep you up to date on what's going on with the research.